Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we are going to be covering the first few chapters of Romans because it's very interesting. And Paul is an open theist. I'll establish that in a different video at some other time. But uh, we'll see these open theistic concepts play out in his ideas of how, how God works and functions and God's conception of justice, how God acts and reacts, and God's uh, tool belt of reactions. What God can do in any given circumstance varies based on what God feels like at the time, how God reacts with emotion and anger, how God gives up on people and uh, pushes them away, how God uh, looks over people's sins sometimes and, and just uh, brushes it aside for in, in pursuit of a different goal. And you find all these concepts in Romans 1 through 3 at least. So we'll cover that today. Romans. Romans is a church that Paul did not found. And when he's writing this letter to the Romans, it's very obvious he's never visited there. And he talks about that uh, he, he queries God daily. He prays to God daily, asking if there's some way, some way in God's will that he could come to Rome. So Paul is an open theist. He thinks that God has these grand plans and God has an agenda and God tries to accomplish this agenda but that agenda, the details could vary. There, there could be different ways of accomplishing the same plans. And so Paul asks God, he says, is there some way that I can go to Rome? He's writing to the Roman Christians and he says this, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. And without cease, I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if by some means now at last it may find a way in the will of God to come to you. God's will has various ways of being accomplished. And Paul is praying for uh, some sort of method of accomplishing God's will through him going to Rome. And we do find out uh, later uh, in Acts that he, he gets his wish fulfilled. He gets to go to Rome which ends up being his undoing. He is eventually killed in Rome as a martyr, and so it didn't really work out quite the way that he thought. He thought he was going to go to Spain, and that never happened. It was never accomplished. He was killed before that. So notice the open theism. There is flexibility in the future. There, God has different methods of accomplishing his plans. Paul thinks that he could appeal to God and change God's mind, and that God will listen to him as a man and changed based on his queries to God. He believes he has a relationship with God. And that's what we see throughout the Bible. And all these prayers to God, these petitionary prayers, they think that they can influence God. They think that God listens to them. And then we find examples exactly of that. Ezekiel is commanded to cook his food with human waste, human poop. And he says, God, this, this is unclean. I, please no, please no. And then God says, okay, animal poop. We'll, we'll switch it. He, he changes it on the fly due to a petition of one of his beloved. And Paul uses that actually. He calls people God's beloved. God loves people. God has a relationship with people. God values people. People have value to God. He says this, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves these people. God has a relationship with these people. It's, it's a relationship. And remember, that's impossible in the Platonic notion of God, where God's a singularity. God has no relation to anything else because relationships cause parts. Relationships cause changes. And God has to be in this abstract other world, yeah, unrelated to everything else that exists. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the Jews. That's not the God of the Old Testament. Not the God of the New Testament. Nothing like that. In the Bible, God is deeply relational. And you could query God and petition God and change God's mind. And God will react to how you act. God is reactive. Of course, God also is very active and he does stuff and he accomplishes stuff. But in, in justice, in the principles of justice that are put out here, God reacts to what people do. God sees what they do, do and then he reacts to it. God is reactive in that sense. So back to Paul's motivations. What is he doing with this letter? He is querying the Church of Rome. And he eventually, we learn, uh, he his goal is to build a base in Rome so that they could fund his ministries outside of Rome, uh, to Spain and elsewhere. 
And so he needs to convince them of the things that he is preaching, uh, his theology, his gospel, uh, to a people that he's never met before. This is why Romans is Paul's theological treatise. He is teaching people who have never heard his gospel, his gospel. And that's why people look to Romans to understand the core of what Paul believes and preaches. And he's not writing to a receptive audience. He's writing to a very hostile audience. And you see him respond to accusations against himself. He knows the rumors that are going around about him, that uh, maybe he steals money or maybe that he's going around with women, you know, stuff like that. Things that uh, he preaches lawlessness. He teaches antinomianism. He, that there should be no law and we should all be free to do whatever sin that we want. And he responds to all these things in turn because he knows the rumors about him. He has to address every single one. And then he also has to fight their prejudices, what they currently believe, and then convert them to his gospel. So we get some hints of some of his goals uh, right away. He starts talking about Jews and Greeks. Remember, Paul had a special ministry to the Gentiles. There's the Acts 15 compromise, which he has sent to the Gentiles. This was his message from the start. Every time he enters a new city, first he queries the Jews, and often they reject him. That's like the normal course. And then he'll turn to the Gentiles, and they'll say, he'll say, Hey, how about you guys don't get circumcised? I got this other way to be, be a Jewish uh, Christian, or uh, we're God-fearer. And uh, the Gentiles say, hey, that sounds pretty good. I don't, I don't want to be chopping off parts of my body and stuff like that. And so he's pretty popular with the Gentiles in that regard. But his goal here is to break down those barriers, this Jewish-Gentile divide, saying that these God-fearers are equal to these Jews, even though the God-fearers don't follow all the symbolic laws, such as circumcision. And he puts that first and foremost in his writings this idea of circumcision. And he talks about circumcision of the heart in chapter 2. He, he is breaking down mental barriers. These Jews think they are superior. These Jews think that they're the chosen ones, that these Gentiles are lesser people. The Jews think that they have a special place in history, and he has to assault that head on. And to do that, he has to not only defend himself from accusations, but also lay out an argument as to why they are equal to the Gentiles. And you see them skillfully, skillfully uh, deconstruct their worldview, their ideas about the Bible. Watch what happens in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. He's fighting lawlessness. He's fighting people who sin. And what's he basing this on? He's saying these people should know better. These people are culpable because they have knowledge of right and wrong. God has showed them the truth and they reject it. Therefore, they are culpable. This is culpability based on knowledge. And uh, that's justice, by the way, that uh, people should be judged based on their situation. All, all justice should be situational. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He points out two attributes of God, eternal power and Godhead. So, and he says these are obvious to these people who are rejecting God. Therefore, they're culpable for not believing in these things. This is our first uh, hint of, uh, Paul likes to do more, more so than anywhere else in the Bible, these kind of little formulaic things about about God. Uh, we'll get into that in a different podcast and see how that develops in time. The Gnostics pick up on some of this formulaic laying down of attributes and they expand on it greatly into the Platonic realm. I don't think Paul was quite there yet. It, you might say he might be Platonized a little bit and he might be Platonized a little bit, but I don't think it fundamentally changed the Jewish picture of God that uh, the normal Jews held. And you see that throughout his writings, how God is in heaven, God is going to come back, establish his kingdom. Jesus is at the right hand of God. God sits on the throne. It's not this idea that God is this eternal orb of nothingness out in nowhere. God is a person. God is personal. God responds to us. God interacts with us. And even though God is not seen, uh, you can see and visit God if you go into heaven and if you're holy. These are Paul's ideas about how God works and how God operates. So watch what's going on here. God is judging people. God knows that they know better. God has revealed himself to them. 
they shouldn't be acting out in unrighteousness. This is Paul saying unrighteousness is evil. This is something he needs to reinforce. Remember, he is being accused of preaching lawlessness. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools. These are the people who should know better. And change the glory of the incorruptible God. See, there's another attribute. God is incorruptible. God is eternal. God doesn't decay, you know. This is that idea. Into an image made like corruptible man. Man decays. Man dies. Man, man fades out. And of birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. This is idolatry. Idols which are railed against throughout the Old Testament. This is what Paul's concerns are. The, the false idol worship versus the worship of the true God. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness. Notice God's reaction. So God expects better of them. God gives them everything they need to believe. They reject God. They start worshiping other gods. And God just lets them go. He says, whatever, fine. I'm going to push you guys off. You guys do what you want. And it's not this instant wrath. And you see this as a constant theme throughout these chapters where God overlooks instances. God, God keeps going. But there is a wrath that's being stored up. And you read about this wrath being stored up uh, not only in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, but also in later chapters, he talks about this wrath being stored up. God is going to judge eventually. It's not an instant judgment. God is giving time. God is allowing people to repent, but not forever. It's, it's not going to be infinite. God's forbearance. God is putting up with things. In Paul's theology, God is in time. God experiences these things, and God has to put up with these things for a time before he can right the wrong. Notice the relationality. Notice how God has emotions. God's uh, wrath. Wrath is associated with anger. God sees the wickedness, and he gets angry. And part of that is due to the fact that these people know better. They have the information to make the right choices, yet they do not. We start into chapter 2, and it begins with Paul railing against the Jews, which is pretty funny. He needs to tear them down. They have a, a elevated status of themselves. They are the teachers of the law. They have the law. They know the law. They teach the law. And he has to pull them off their high horse. So he starts laying into them. He calls them hypocrites, basically. He says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Whatever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And he tells them that uh, Romans 2.24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He says, you guys are causing the Gentiles blaspheme God because you are judging hypocritically. He is tearing them down. He's saying, you guys are not better than these Gentiles. And from this tearing down, from there he could start building up. But he needs to equalize the Jews and the Gentiles before he could start explaining his gospel. Because if the Jews still are under the impression that they don't need Jesus, that they don't need uh, this forgiveness of sins, that they are saved by virtue of their righteousness, and then the Gentiles have to attain what they've attained, then his gospel falls flat. His gospel doesn't have any teeth because he's not reaching people who need the gospel. He needs to tell them that they need the gospel as well. Notice this language, and it's very justice-based. And God is a God of justice that renders to each according to his deeds. Paul writes, Eternal life to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, skipping forward, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Look at that equalizing language. He says, God is a God of justice who judges based on clear criteria everyone, the Jew and Gentile. There's no difference. He says, for there is no partiality with God. Everyone's on equal footing. This is brand new to his audience. They would reject that because they thought the Jews were the superior ones. The Jews were the ones to inherit the kingdom. The Gentiles would bring tribute to the Jews, and the Gentiles would have to convert to Judaism if they want this special place in, in the post-apocalyptic uh, world. Not post-apocalyptic like uh, you know Mad Max or anything like that, but after the day of judgment, after God comes back and rights the wrongs and establishes the kingdom, the Jews were supposed to be the ones who rule over the world, and the Gentiles would be subservient. And he's equalizing that. He says, you guys aren't better than these Gentiles. You guys don't have that special place. You guys need to rethink what's going on here. 
You see a lot of equalizing language in the second part of the second chapter. For as many as have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You, you know, it, it does, doesn't benefit you. You're judged based on what you do. God is a God of justice. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are the law unto themselves. He's tearing down the law. The law means nothing. The law doesn't actually do anything, and the Jews would have a strong objection to this. There's an interesting phrase in 2.16, In the day God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God has knowledge of the secrets. Uh, to Paul, it's the same as that, that in Ezekiel, where God knows the secret doings of people in the secret places. God takes Ezekiel and brings him into the secret chamber where false gods are worshipped underground, where they thought that they were out of God's line of sight. God's line of sight was blocked by the mountain or the hill or, or a roof or something like that. And so they do their deeds in secret. And God says, no, I know the secrets of man. God, God knows what's going on on earth. God has knowledge of all things on earth. God, God has uh, eyes, as the Proverbs say, on the ways of the good and the evil. God's watching. So look at this picture of who he is addressing, this picture of this Jew who he's tearing down. Indeed, you who are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? These Jews are arrogant. These Jews are saying, I'm the teacher. I teach everyone everything. I'm righteous. I'm, I'm God's chosen. Do you say, do not commit adultery? Do you commit adultery? Do you not abhor idols? Do you rob temples? Skip and forward. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Watch this. He reverses it as well, that the Gentiles become circumcised in, in, in concept, in concept. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Notice also what's going on here. Circumcision is a part of the law. He's excluding that. He's saying that that symbolic act does not matter for God's ultimate judgment. Uh, you cutting off of the flesh, the cutting off of this this uh, ritualistic act of uh, mutilating ourselves is, is irrelevant to God's justice, that uh, God judges each person based on their action. He says this, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. That means there are Jews who could be violating the law. Those people aren't real Jews. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. So there's Gentiles who could keep the law. It doesn't matter if they're circumcised or not they will be considered righteous by God. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision, that is of the heart, and the spirit, not the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Notice this, God praises people. This is, this is a no-no in Calvinism. Remember, in Calvinism, God can't get anything for himself. God has no needs of the outside world. God can't benefit from anything exterior to him. But in Paul, God benefits from us. You know, just as the Old Testament says, God sings over us. God praises men. And God has beloved. In the first chapter, he says that God has beloved in human beings. God has value in us. We are God's imagers. And God takes joy in us. God wants a relationship with us. This is the Yahweh. This is the God that Paul worships. A relational God. Open theistic God who changes, who responds, who listens to prayers, who cares about the needs of his people and responds accordingly. A God of justice, one that will overlook things at certain times, one will, which will respond in wrath at certain times. It depends on the circumstances and it depends on God's emotions. God, God sometimes reacts in, in emotion. Per this, in his wrath, he will judge. Chapter 3. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? He just tore down circumcision. He just attacked a sacred cow of the Jews. And so he has to build it back up so that they don't just reject him straight out of the gate as a heretic, someone who should not be considered. He has to tell them that there is some value to this thing that God prescribed 
uh, in the Old Testament for the Jews to set them apart as a special people. He has to build it back up after tearing it down as a method of salvation or a method of differentiating righteousness from unrighteousness. He, he attacked those concepts. So he has to build circumcision up in some fashion in order to not lose his audience. He says, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. You get the benefit of being God's people. You got the benefit of getting commandments directly from God, direct communion with God. So notice what Paul is doing here. He, there's more accusations against the Jews that the Jews are faithless. The Jews have failed in their taskings. And the one response to that is, uh, you know, if people fail, the more people fail, the more God is faithful. That God just increases in his uh, justice and mercy. And that uh, God's forbearance is just illustrated all the more. And uh, Paul addresses this accusation or this claim. He says this, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. He's going to say that uh, if God's punishing these people, men might say, oh, God is being unjust because he promised forbearance for these people, that they are going to be the special people. He says, certainly not, for how will God judge the world? God needs to judge on a standard of equity. God has to judge rationally, relationally. Uh, he has to just judge based on justice, justice, not based on uh, just overlooking everything. He says this, and why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. So he's being accused of lawlessness, antinomianism, that everyone could do what they want and uh, that, that their their unrighteousness will be to God's glory because God will just overlook it. God will forgive it. God, the, in, in Paul's theology, the blood of Jesus, the atoning sacrifice will just cover it all. So it doesn't matter how many sins that you commit. Just go on committing sins, have all the adultery you want, uh, steal everything you want. Now, all of that's fine because Jesus' blood covers everything. And he says, I don't, I don't teach that. That's not the things that I'm teaching. I'm not teaching the same thing that the Jews are thinking about God, that God's forbearance of uh, the Jewish, Jewish unbelief, that that's a good thing because that demonstrates God's mercy and forbearance. That's not how we should act. That's not how we should live. And we should condemn people who tell us to live in sin. So let, let's, let's take a moment to, to look at Paul's argument style, look at how Paul thinks and acts and writes and, and how he uses situations, how he reverses situations, how he thinks. Look at this. So they are saying that if God sits by and allows this unrighteousness in the Jews to continue and forbears it and is still faithful for his promise, then uh, God's mercy, God's faithfulness is ever increased. But at the same time, they accuse Paul of teaching lawlessness by teaching that it really doesn't matter what you do because Jesus' uh, blood, his death, uh, perpetuates everything. It, 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 his sacrifice covers all our past sins. And they're accusing him of lawlessness for that, whereas he's actually switching that around on them and saying, if, if your argument's true, then you have no criticism against me for what I'm teaching. Plus, plus what I'm teaching you right now, reversing your claims, is actually a more just picture of God. I'm, I'm preaching justice. You're preaching the injustice. And he says, if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? He's saying, I am presenting the more just, the more righteous picture of God. To Paul, it really mattered God's character, that uh, God is judged on a standard of righteousness by humans. You know, Calvinists, they don't they don't like this idea. They, they think that God is above judgment by man. And, and Paul, he doesn't think so at all. He thinks that uh, people should judge God how God is perceived by human beings because God's not above it all and God can be judged and God the the picture of God which is more just which has more righteousness that that's the better picture of God and that should be commended rather than condemned it's funny it's funny what he's doing here he's not a Calvinist Paul is not a Calvinist nothing in his theology is Calvinism he goes back to tearing down the Jews. He needs to put them on equal footing with the Gentiles. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Back to chapter 2. Uh, people are judged based on their actions, and the people who sin will be judged for those sins. And that's why he says, 
There was none righteous, no, not one. And he kind of he kind of pulls this out of context. And in, in King David, when King David is writing this, uh, there are righteous in that chapter. King David counts himself among the righteous. There's a generation of the righteous. And this is talking about wicked people in general. But Paul subverts that. He changes kind of the meaning of that to apply to the current circumstances where he's trying to show equal footing between Gentiles and Jews. So he takes the meaning and twists it to make a point. And you'll see this often in the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Proof texts are changed. They're they're modified to meet the current situation. They're not used on a one-to-one ratio to mean the original point. That's not the purpose of a proof text. Notice this section, therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Knowledge causes sinfulness. It's it's interesting, it's interesting. If you know the law and you're violating the law, that increases your sinfulness. It's culpability based on knowledge. People are culpable based on their circumstances. In Calvinism, remember, everyone is predestined to do everything that they do. Every sin is micromanaged by God. They have no culpability. Those are things that they're forced to do. But in Paul's theology, in this justice-orientated theology, people are based on their situation. If people were robots and forced to commit all these sins, uh, then they're not culpable because they didn't have the choice. They weren't able to reject this life. They, They weren't able to use their knowledge to inform their decisions. God's wrath makes no sense at all in this situation where God is controlling the thing. Then he gets angry and then he judges and wrath. And and that would defeat Paul's entire point about this justice that he's laying out, that God judges based on circumstances, that God judges righteously and uh, based on who people are and what people do and how culpable those people are and their level of effort, their level of knowledge. And, And people are only guilty through their knowledge. And we remember, we established this before. Even the Gentiles know God's invisible attributes. They're obvious to them. And so the Gentiles have a law written in their heart that they're judged based against. And if they didn't have this law, then they're not culpable. They're not culpable. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. That's an interesting phrase. He's saying that the law reveals God's standards of justice. But there's another standard of righteousness that's being revealed through Jesus Christ, that God is showing mercy and love and forgiveness through this different act. Rather than giving the law, rather than showing this standard of justice through written text and codified law, through actions, God is using relationships in order to show his righteousness. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ who all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. No difference. He's, he's equalizing the playing field here. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. We're all on the equal playing field, equalizing everything. Jews and Gentiles, there's no difference. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to de- demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Look at that. Forbearance. God endears. God forbears. God is in time. God, God is watching history as it passes and has to, has to forbear sins, deal with it. He has to look over these sins. God forbeared and passed over the sins that were previously committed waiting for this opportunity to give redemption, to give propitiation, to give give a means of attaining righteousness through Jesus Christ. And this this seems like it seems like Paul is writing that this takes some sort of toll on God, that God is forbearing this. God is putting up with the noisy kid in efforts to watch that kid grow and ha- he has a plan for that kid. God is forbearing with a greater goal in mind. This also <laughs> This also, again, attacks this doctrine of the Calvinist, that God has no relationship with the world, doesn't get anything from the world, has has no give and take with the world, anything like that, that God has to forbear and is putting up with and has to weigh different options and prioritize different options in his overall plans. That's what's going on here. Paul writes, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. The Jews would not like this line. He goes on to say, Or is he the God of the Jews only? So he attacks them. He says, if God is just judging based on this law, well, the Gentiles didn't have the law. The law is like a Jewish thing. 
And so God is judging on a standard that's higher than this law, that's different than this law, this law that's specifically Jewish in origin and nature. He says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? And the Jews will have to say, yeah, he's God of both the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are judged on this different standard. So yeah, it's, it's, it's obvious that the law doesn't really apply to them in the same way that applies to us. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. It's not that those prepositions by faith and through faith mean inherently different things. He's just saying there's a difference. There's a difference between Jews and Gentiles still, but they're both going to be judged on a standard of faith. This last line, and we're going to end the podcast on this note, he says this, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Remember, he, he tears down. Then he builds back up. He says, oh, oh, all these laws, they, they mean nothing. Then he builds it back up. Jewish Gentile, that means nothing. Then he builds it back up. He says there's a purpose for the law. There's a purpose for Judaism. There's a purpose for God's chosen people. And then he equalizes. He breaks down and he builds back up. And so he doesn't lose his audience. His audience would be infuriated by the things that he's written. Equating Jews and Gentiles, leveling the playing field. This is things that they were not taught, that they do not believe, that they didn't grow up with this idea of uh, Jewish-Gentile equality. The Jews were always superior. The, G the Gentiles were dogs. The, you know, they were the foreigners, the pigs, the people, the, you know, the goy or whatever that uh, the, the modern Jews call the Gentiles. The Gentiles were the inferiors. And he is attacking that notion head on. So I hope to get out of this podcast today, just kind of a brief look on Paul's concepts of who God is, how God acts and reacts, God's sense of justice, culpability, that people are culpable based on who they are, their circumstances, how much knowledge they have. It's If the Calvinist views were correct, man would not be culpable in the least. There would be no reason to condemn man. There's nothing that man could do to avoid the things that they do and think and say. And in Paul's theology, that would be unjust. God would be a monster, a moral monster in Paul's theology. But instead, God is active, reactive. Paul could pray to God. Paul could change God's mind. Paul could uh, get God to take different paths than God would take otherwise. This is a relational God, the God that Paul affirms. If you have any questions or comments, start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page or leave a comment on the YouTube channel or send me an email, anything works. It should be good. Thank you for listening.